Taylor Swift's latest album, The Tortured Poets Department, dropped last night and has tons of wagging in the media, both social media and old school. Taylor, being Taylor, broke ranks with her record label Universal and dropped the first songs on TikTok, unveiling what, it, what she called the ultimate Taylor Swift in-app experience. Like her music or not, Swift has become a global phenomenon. She is an economic powerhouse who has crashed Ticketmaster and even been credited as lifting local economies through her era's tour. So Jess, I have not made it all the way through the album just yet. I think I'm only about seven tracks in. And this woman continues to kill us because she released the first like 13 or 15 songs at midnight and then had another surprise drop at 2 a.m. where she announced that it was secretly a double album. So people had to suddenly rush to listen to the other half. And I just don't have time in my life for 30 plus songs, but I'm going to do my best. Um, so far, it seems like the bulk of the album is about her short-lived flame, Maddie Healy, who is the lead singer of the 1789. Yes, 1975? 1975. 1989. 1989 is Taylor. It's hard. It gets confusing. Too many numbers. But, yeah, too many numbers. I think a lot of people were expecting more songs about Joe Alwyn, who she was with for, for quite some time. They saw the track preview, and they were like, so long, London. Maddie Healy also is a Londoner, so what are we going to do? Obviously, after listening to it, there are clear cues that it's about Maddie Healy. And I think maybe Midnight's was the breakup album. So much of her music was about a, a relationship falling apart that I can't imagine a person happy in their relationship writing. It's almost like she did this classic move, which is not the most healthy move, but a, a trend on TikTok these days of women talking about dating them until you hate them, that you break up with them in your mind slowly before you actually do it with words. And that by the time you have that conversation, you've already moved on. Maybe that's how the Taylor Swift, Joe Allen thing went. And this really is the Maddie Healy album. But I do think it's very art of war playing the long game for her to release this album that everyone's saying it's about Joe, it's about Joe, and have it be about her most recent ex instead. It's almost more devastating than a very devastating album about Joe for Joe. Right. It is interesting how everyone has gone back to re-listen to Midnight's in the aftermath of the Joe Alwyn breakup and kind of reading a lot of the songs really differently than how we did when they were first together. We found out that they had apparently broken up several times during their six-year relationship. And one of the songs that always stuck out to me on Midnight's was the song where she sings about uh, in, in Lavender Haze about not wanting to be a housewife and describing it as 1950s stuff. And now looking back, it seems like she was more trying to convince herself that she was okay with not being married as opposed to really truly believing that that wasn't for her and seemed to be one of the dead ends that they hit in their relationship was that they didn't want to get married to each other or Joe didn't want to marry her, whatever the direction that that was going in. One of the things that I always have a trouble with when it comes to listening to a lot of Taylor's music I was all in with her first country album uh, back when I was in middle school and have listened to everything since, but don't describe myself as a Swifty. And one of the reasons why is she is very intent on sort of painting herself as a victim in all of these exchanges that she has with either men or her fans or the media. And this is a woman who is a billionaire, who is probably the most famous pop star in the world, had this hugely successful eras tour. And so in some of the songs on this album that I've listened to so far, she gets really angry with her fans for complaining about her relationship with Maddie Healy, sort of point, paints herself as this kind of underdog. And it just seems at odds with the public persona of this woman who has multiple private jets that she uses to fly, you know, just one state away when she could easily drive, or um, again, has this mega tour, has all of this money, multiple properties. That kind of dichotomy of her being this very big global phenomenon and then casting herself as the underdog victim in a lot of her writing is something that really bothers me personally. I don't know if um, you've noticed the same thing, Jess. I think it's just highlighted for me this long-held belief I have that sometimes the richest people are genuinely the most unhappy people. Mm. I think that could be true for Miss Taylor. I think... 
it was an interesting move that she went to Apple Music and she did something that not a lot of artists have done where she made custom playlists to re-listen to her recent music, sometimes categorizing the, the playlist in the stages of grief talking about her albums that came out, the Lover album, which a lot of people understood to be this happy album about being in love was actually about being terribly delusional. And so she had all of these people re-listen to her music right before this album came out from her genuine perspective. And at the first listen of the Tortured Poets Department, I, I haven't listened to the 2 a.m. release, I was sleeping, but this album feels very raw. It feels like the first step of an artist going to the heart of something they went through. She said in the Eras tour, I just really needed to write this album. It reminded me why I'm a songwriter. It was so personally important for me. And it really feels like she did that hard first step as an artist of getting the pain out of you and turning it into art. But there's a second really necessary step of like packaging that for the rest of the world. And it seems like she made an intentional choice not to do that, to just leave it raw which we could understand to be an artistic choice. I think great music is really cathartic, going to the heart of something. It's why I love the blues. But it seems to me that it's not being received with that perspective. A lot of people are saying Taylor Swift is really tired and needs a break. A lot of this writing wasn't refined. You know, the melodies weren't as catchy as we're used to. What's going on here? So I'm curious to see if, if that kind of narrative continues after people listen to the 2 a.m. release as well. Yeah, you use the word delusional, which kind of stuck out to me because um, one of the singles on her previous album, Midnight's, was Antihero, where she describes herself as the problem. And it was almost a little sarcastic in the tone, but maybe she really meant it. Maybe she really does believe now that she is the problem and she's responsible for a lot of the either failed relationships or some of the disappointments that she's had in her life. It's not clear, I think, still just how much self-awareness Taylor really has. And as a 30-something year old woman who again has had all this massive success, it's a bit concerning if she doesn't have that. Um, and you mentioned the Apple Music thing and this reminded me of another one of these sort of grudges that she holds and maybe some of the pettiness that comes from Taylor, which is something that admittedly resonates with a lot of young women because we tend to be very emotional creatures. But she had this long running feud with Katy Perry, another pop star, and on the day she had taken her music off of Spotify to protest the like minimal earnings that artists would get from streams there. And she only had her music available on other streaming services. But then on the day that Katy Perry released a new album during their feud, Taylor also announced that all of her music was then going to be available on Spotify. And so it seemed like a very calculated move to prevent Katy Perry from getting all of the streams because they share a similar fan base. And then she had this sort of skirmish with uh, Kanye West and Kim Kardashian where they had argued over whether or not she had given permission for Kanye to speak sort of derogatorily about her in one of his songs and recordings of the phone call kind of give air to both sides, but it led to her being called a snake by a lot of fans. Um, so, I mean, all of these sort of past feuds perhaps help inform her work a little bit and how she does view herself a little bit as a victim of media coverage that she considers sexist or um, some of these personal spats that she's had with other celebrities. But I think it's nice to see that most of this album is at least maybe more about this relationship that a lot of people were seeking insight into. She got a lot of backlash for dating Maddie Healy because viewers who might not be aware, he's sort of considered part of like the dirtbag left where he's very progressive but is not politically correct and makes a lot of off-color jokes either during his shows or is willing to appear on podcasts that do that. And a lot of people hit at her for being willing to date someone who made offensive jokes. And in the album, I mean, to her credit, I actually respect her for this. She basically tells them it's none of their business and it's her choice who she dates and this parasocial relationship that she, she has with her fans, she's maybe not super interested in having anymore. That's gonna do it for us this week on Rising. Let us know in the comments what you think of the new Taylor Swift album if you listen. I'm prepared for plenty of you to tell us that you hate that we even covered this, but we had to do it, sorry. <laughs> Jess, it was great to see you as always this Friday. Yes, happy Friday, everyone. Sorry to bother you with furries and Taylor Swift, but we had fun, at the very least, that's two. That counts. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe so you never miss any content. 
And for those of you who like to listen while on the go, we are now available anywhere you listen to podcasts. Thanks for watching. Bye, y'all.